So welcome everyone to this online meeting of the Edinburgh Bibliographical Society and um, just to say we're recording this meeting and um, my name's Helen Vincent, I'm a member of the EBS committee, I'm in your host today introducing this talk and um, before the talk starts, just as the slide says, please do turn your camera off. That improves the connection for everyone. Leave your microphone muted to minimize background noise. And we really do welcome questions or comments. Please do use the chat to make these comments or to ask questions at the end of the meeting. Um, we, if you're tweeting or sharing on social media about this event, use the hashtag EdinBibSoc. And um, welcome to everyone today. We're here to hear Megan Constantinou speak to us about the library of Sir Gilbert Elliot. And Megan is a private rare book curator in the Boston, Massachusetts area. She's currently pursuing a PhD in library and information science at Simmons University, where her research focuses on personal library catalogues in the digital age, both as media forms and tools for knowledge production and sharing. Her interests include bibliography, book collecting, especially by women, and the history of private libraries. And Megan serves as the librarian of the Grolio Club, which is where I first met her from 2011 to 2022, and has been a member of the club since 2013. She's a member of the Society of Printers and an officer in our sister organization, the Bibliographical Society of America and the American Printing History Association. Her interest in Sir Gilbert Elliot's second Baronet of Minto forms part of a larger project on the history of the Elliot Family Library. And some of you may have heard her speak on this wider subject earlier this year um, at a Bibliographical Society meeting, but we're really pleased to have her here today at the Edinburgh Bibliographical Society, um, which of course is an older organisation than the Bibliographical Society down in London. We always like to get that in. So over to Megan, who's going to talk to us about an early Enlightenment bibliophile, the Library of Sir Gilbert Elliot, Second Baronet of Minto. Thanks, Megan. Great, Helen, thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen. How is that? Good? That's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, yes, thank you so much for that introduction and for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to share this research with you. I've been working on this for a while, and I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. Um, first, I'd just like to thank the Bibliographical Society for supporting my research on this topic on the Library of the Elliots of Minto through a 2020 Freds and Bowers Award, which allowed me to conduct a week's worth of research at the National Library of Scotland. Not nearly enough, I need to go back, but it was, it was so much fun. I also wanna thank Bill Zacks, who um, kindly offered me an extended stay in his scholar's apartment at Blackie House, and who has supported me in many ways throughout this project. Um, and finally, I'd just like to take a moment to express my thanks to the reading room staff at NLS who pulled dozens and dozens, it felt like endless numbers of volumes for me in a very short period of time with extraordinary kindness and patience. I really appreciated that. Um, so about seven years ago, while I was working at a project at the Grolier Club, I noticed a group of eight manuscript uh, library catalogs on our shelves documenting the library of the Elliots of Minto an aristocratic family um, coming from the Scottish borders who were active in British civic and political life from the late 17th to the early 20th centuries. The catalogs, um, which were probably, as far as I can tell, all acquired in the late 1960s via an exchange with a and Munby, um, dated between 1738 and 1938, a span of 200 years, which drew my attention because in my experience, it's rare to find a cache of private library catalogs um, covering such a long period of time for a single family. Um, but when I tried to learn more about the Elliot's life with books, particularly in their literary interests, I didn't find very much published research on the subject. So I decided I would try to sketch out the contours of this library to give it some shape um, so it could be studied further. And so over the last few years, I've been gathering up the various sources of evidence I can find. So not only the catalogs themselves, but also archival evidence from the extensive Minto family papers at NLS, some surviving books from the now dispersed library and um, miscellaneous bits of information that I've been able to pick up from published memoirs and correspondence. Um, but today I want to dive in and take a closer look at one member of the family, Sir Gilbert Elliot, second baronet of Minto, 
born around 1693 and died in 1766, whose manuscript library catalog of 1738 is the earliest of the Minto catalogs at the Grolier Club. Although Sir Gilbert was a prominent intellectual and civic figure in early 18th century Edinburgh, he has been largely overshadowed by his more famous son, Sir Gilbert Elliot, third baronet, a member of parliament known for his eloquent speeches and a correspondent of David Hume, among other enlightenment figures. Yet it's the, Sarah, it's the second baronet, as far as I can tell, who first established the Elliot Family Library in the 1730s or thereabouts. And it is also due to his influence that his son and also his daughter, Jean, who we will meet in this talk later on, developed their strong literary interests. So my goal for tonight is um, to introduce you to the second baronet, to discuss his role in building the family library, and then in a very, very cursory way, to um, place his collection into a larger context by comparing it with some of his Scottish contemporaries. Um, <clears throat> Sir Gilbert Elliot was born around 1693 into a family that descended from an old Scottish Borders Reaver clan. The family rose to prominent, prominence under his father, um, shown here on the right, also named Sir Gilbert Elliot, um, the first baronet. The elder Elliot was a legal writer, a covenanter, a staunch anti-Jacobite who played a significant role in the attempted rebellion of the ninth Earl, um, Earl of Argyll against James VII in June 1685 and was exiled to Holland. When he returned to Scotland in 1688, he was elected to the Faculty of Advocates, and in 1700, he was created baronet. In 1703, he purchased an old Borders Peel Tower um, called Minto House near Hoyk, Roxburghshire, where that little red pin in, is on the map down there. And that would serve as the family seat until the middle of the 20th century. In 1705, he was appointed a judge in the Court of Session and adopted the legal title Lord Minto. His son, the second baronet, followed his father in the legal profession, beginning his studies in civil law at the University of Utrecht in 1712. He was admitted advocate of the Scots Bar in July 1715, succeeded to the estate and was married in 1718, and served a brief stint as MP of Roxburghshire in 1722 to 26. Um, he was then uh, appointed to the bench in the Court of Session. In 1733, he became Lord of Justiciary, serving on criminal cases, and he remained in this position until 1763 when he was promoted to Lord Justice Clerk, the second highest ranking judicial, well, you all know, <laughs> in Scotland, um, immediately succeeding Charles Ereskine, another bibliophile judge who I will mention a few times in this talk. Politically, he was a staunch Whig and anti-Jacobite like his father. He supported the pro-union policies of his close friend, Archibald Campbell, the third Duke of Argyll, and another close personal friend was Lord Kames. Elliot was also an active civic servant with numerous intellectual and artistic, artistic interests, as shown by this list of organizations and committees that he belonged to. He was a very accomplished flute player and especially fond of Italian, writing some verses of his own in that language. He subscribed to literary productions such as Alan Ramsey's first book of collected poems, printed by Thomas Rudiman in 1721. And he was a key supporter, along with Duncan Forbes of Culloden, in publishing the 1719 folio edition of Heart of Canute, um, which was thought to be the remnant of an ancient Scottish epic poem, but later discovered to have been the work of Elizabeth Lady Wardlaw. Other interests were in agricultural and civic improvement. He was almost certainly the author of this anonymous 1752 pamphlet shown on the right proposing improvements to the city of Edinburgh, although it is often credited to his son, the third baronet, and it's, it's possible they may have written it together, um, but family, the family documentation um, seem, seems to be under the impression that it was the elder baronet that wrote it. His personality um, seems to have been somewhat reserved, attentive to his professional duties, but not especially ambitious in relation to them. He was cultivated and refined, happiest when working on civic projects or when retiring at home amid his agricultural, musical, and literary activities. And he also seems to have taken great joy in his large family, which included nine children. With the exception of his years studying abroad in the, in the Netherlands and 
his four years serving as MP, which brought him to London on a regular basis. Elliot spent most of his time traveling between Edinburgh and Minto House in Roxburghshire. In or around 1726, the year he was raised to the bench, he commissioned William Adam, um, the architect who was another close friend, to design and build a handsome 46 foot square townhouse in Edinburgh named like the country estate Minto House. And um, incidentally, this has caused some confusion in the documentary record with these two different houses. So just something to keep in mind if you come across it, um, it's a little confusing. The townhouse was built on present day Chamber Street, uh, accessible through the Horse Wind, which is um, now near the central campus of the university in what was formerly called Argyll Square. And then um, this original townhouse was demolished in, I think, 1871, but another Minto house was built in its place to serve as a medical building. And now that later building is still used at the university by art and architecture students. So some of you might know it, but it's not the original one. A decade later, Elliot also made major improvements to the country house in the borders, commissioning William Adam between about 1738 and the mid-1740s to encase and expand the old Peel Tower. Adam's design transformed the house into an unusual V-shaped design, retaining the core of the original tower at center. <clears throat> um, and you can kind of see from this aerial manuscript map in this elevation drawing, which is the earliest documentation I've been able to find about it, um, what it what it looked like in that period. Unfortunately, the house was demolished in the 1990s. So all we have to go on are um, maps and um, some later photography and some archival records. But I think this is as close as I've been able to get at least to the 18th century house. One of the additions in the new country house did include a library um, room, which I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later. So um, now let's, now that we know about Sir Gilbert Elliot, second baronet, let's look at his library a little more closely. While he clearly had a long and rich life with books, his manuscript catalog dates to 1738, and much of the documentary evidence that I could find is also clustered around this time. So I'm going to focus mainly on this, this period and the years leading up to it, so kind of 1720s, 1730s. So um, let's start with a picture of where we are in space and time. In 1738, Elliot is about 45 years old. He's been on the bench for 12 years and he's been Lord of Justiciary for four years. He still has almost 30 years left to his life and career. His oldest child is 18 and his youngest hasn't been born yet. So he's really in the thick of life at this time. Politically, we are 30 years out from the Union, but still seven years away from the uprising of 1745. Newtown won't be built for a few more decades, so the city is still feeling a bit cramped and overcrowded, but there is evidence of growth and improvement as Edinburgh begins its transformation to a modern commercial city. The Edinburgh Musical Society, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and Alan Ramsey Circulating Library are a decade old. Theaters are starting to appear. William Adams' new Royal Infirmary building has just gone up, and Elliot is involved with many of these civic activities and has established himself professionally and socially. The library catalog itself is a folio bound in plain contemporary reverse calf. The entries are in alphabetical order and record the author, a short title, the place and date of publication, the size and the number of volumes. It looks to have been written in a single neat hand with ample spaces between the entries and sometimes even between pages, presumably to make room for additions. It lists 1,625 titles in 2,263 volumes. And I'm going with these numbers based on my Excel spreadsheet. There may not be perfect, but I think it's, it's about right. Um, and then this slide shows the collection at a glance in terms of imprint dates, imprint locations, languages, and subjects. Um, and the subjects, I should stress, are the result of my own attempt at categorization um, since the catalog is alphabetical. Um, so it's, again, not perfect, but um, I think reasonably accurate. And then also just another note here that the numbers I'm using relate to titles, not volumes. Um, so I do want to talk about the subjects in some detail, but first I want to look at a few other aspects of the library. 
um, namely the size, the geographical distribution of imprints, and the chronological range, especially to the degree that this might um, inform us about, about Eliot's book binding. So to begin with um, size, 2,263 volumes was a substantial but not extraordinary size for a library of the member of a member of the landed gentry at this time. Dr. Murray Simpson, in his essay on private libraries in the second volume of the Edinburgh History of the Book in Scotland, notes that in 1700, a library of 3,000 volumes would have been exceptional, but by 1800, it was not uncommon. And if we continue to use Simpson's statistics, most gentry collections around 1700 probably contain between 500 and 1,000 volumes, but a few would have surpassed 2,000. Andrew Fletcher of Saltoon's library of about 6,000 volumes at the turn of the century was exceptional. On the other side of our period, the collection of Archibald Campbell, third Earl of Argyll at 12,000 volumes in the 1750s would have been very large. If we look more specifically at the wealthy lawyer class in the 1720s and 30s, we can um, point to the 1731 manuscript private library catalog of Charles Ereskine. Again, that um, Dr. Baston has looked at in depth and that was a very important study for me, I'm grateful to her. Um, Ereskine was an exact, exact contemporary of Lord Minto and as we have seen his immediate predecessor as Lord Justice Clerk. Um, Dr. Baston counted 843 titles in that catalog, so roughly half the size of Minto's. Um, for others, we can look at Lord Pitmedden's library, which sold at auction on 11 January 1720, which had about 3,000 works, as did John Spottiswood's library, auctioned on July 1, 1728, and the library of Alexander Cunningham on November 20, 1730. So although auction sales can be a little um, unreliable because of salting, I think these examples, there are enough of them to show that in general, Lord Minto with his 2,263 volumes was up on, on par with his contemporaries. And then the breakdown of imprints um, places, I think is also what we might expect. Well over a third of the titles were printed in London, but we also get a healthy number of Dutch and French imprints. The group of 84 Edinburgh imprints, uh, which ranged in date between 1582, that's um, the first edition of George Buchanan's History of Scotland, and 1737 shows evidence of the city's active printing industry. And in terms of languages, English dominates, making up a little less than half of the titles, but Latin is also important, particularly for this um, legal library. And we see a good amount of French too. From the imprint dates, we can tell that this is a fairly modern collection. Out of 1,625 titles, approximately 1,500 date between 1,600 and 1738 and nearly half that number date after 1701. Within the period between 1701 and 1738, roughly half the books um, date to the 20 year period after the death of the first baronet in 1718. So we can also tell that the second baronet is actively acquiring books rather than relying very heavily on an inherited collection. And of course, many of the older books could have been acquired secondhand, but we just don't, I just don't have the records to know that. Um, I just wanted to show show this because I really don't, there's very little information about the second baronet's father, um, never mind any information about his literary life, but I did find this one letter at the um, in the Minto papers, which is a letter from the elder Elliot to his son when the latter was about to begin his studies abroad, um, urging him to read the Old and New Testament every day and the Institutes of Calvin and Turretin co to commit them to memory, so... Um, sober reading advice indeed. I don't know how closely his son adhered to it, um, but we do have a 1576 Latin edition of Calvin's Institutes in the library. Um, it's also probable that the second baronet made some purchases when he was studying as a law student abroad in 1712 to 15. So Dr. Baston's work on Charles Ereskine, who was a um, correspondent of Elliot, shows that this was a common practice among law students. There is one book now in Bill Zax's collection um, which may relate to this period in his life, a copy of George Mackenzie's An Idea of the Modern Eloquence of the Bar, published in, in English translation in 1711. Bill's copy is marked with Eliot's initials along with the note that it was gifted by the father of the translator. Um, the translator himself was a young Edinburgh lawyer named Robert Hepburn, 
born around 1690, who was enrolled in the Faculty of Advocates less than a year before Eliot, so they must have known each other. Sadly, Hepburn died prematurely in 1716, and I'm guessing, and it is purely a guess, um, but I think a reasonable one, that the book was given to Eliot by the father um, around that time, around 1716 in memory of his son. Um, but I also wanted to show this to you because it's the only one I've been able to find to date that has Eliot's initials written into it, or honestly, any sign of his, his ownership mark at all. So I wanted to um, sear this into your memory in case anybody sees any others out in the world. Um, but it does seem to be in the 1730s when Eliot's book binding, uh, I'm sorry, book buying activities really increase. So in addition to the library catalog, there are a few items in the NLS archives from this period. One example is this bill for books purchased at um, Crawford's auction in 1736. I haven't been able to find this recorded in any of the standard bibliographies, um, but I have not yet checked contemporary newspapers. Um, so I don't know much about the sale itself, but it does reveal the Baronet's interest in classical, religious, historical, and even bibliographical works. You can notice that I highlighted the, the cotton and the Bodleian catalogs there. We also have some um, correspondence relating to books and reading in the archives from this period. My favorite is a group of three letters written in 1736. Um, so this would the same year as the auction list I just showed you. Um, they were written by George Stewart, who was a factor on Minto Estate in, the, in Roxburghshire, who asked his employers to send books, mainly classical literature, but in another letter he asks for um, newspapers as well. Um, he asks these to be sent to his family on the Minto Estate for reading and improvement, and I just love that we get this little slice of life um, from, from the archive. That Lord Minto was generous in lending his books throughout his life is revealed in a much later letter from um, May 1760 by David Hume, who was writing his history of England at the time, inquiring, quote, I have seen on your table a copy of Voltaire's Universal History. I must beg the favor of your lordship, if it be in the country, to bring it to town with you on the summer session, at least those volumes that precede the year 1500. I know that author cannot be depended on with regard to facts, but his general views are sometimes sound and always entertaining. So um, to get back to the question about the contents of the library, as far as we can tell from the 1738 catalog, um, here's, here's that breakdown again. And it's, it's just loosely built on the five subject system de libre uh, classification scheme, which was popular from the early 18th century. And then I added a few other categories that seemed um, prominent. So as this, um, as these graphs show, the library was rich in legal texts as you would expect, but even stronger in history and politics, classics, and arts and sciences. Um, it's impossible for me to do justice to the rich and varied subject matter in the library in this talk, but I wanted to just give you a flavor. So I'm going to do a rundown here of a few representative examples from each or well, from most of those categories I just showed you, um, illustrated with a copy of a book from Lord Minto's library that I've been able to find out in the world. So within history and politics, we get a range of national and universal histories, military history, biographies, memoirs, um, Anthony Hamilton's memoirs of the Comte de Cremont tells uh, is a sort of typical scandalous courtly memoir that was that was really popular at the time. Other examples include the first edition of Buchanan's History of Scotland, many works by the Italian historian and satirist Gregorio Letti, um, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, and Charles Roland's very popular Ancient History. Um, and I'm sorry for that these photos aren't great. They're like my cell phone shots. Um, some of them are better than others. The arts and sciences category contains a, a lot of variety. I was really impressed by the, the range here. So um, physical and biological sciences, engineering, medicine, domestic household management, books about art and music, educational treatises and conduct books. There were a lot of um, travel and voyage um, works, which I put in here. There are about 50 of those. And um, first editions of really important works like Hooke's Micrographia and Newton's Optics. 
Um, the collection of legal literature include works dealing with both Roman and Scots law, canon and civil texts, legal textbooks, accounts of famous trials, um, uh, works of legal theory, such as the works on natural law by Pufendorf and Grotius. And um, this is just a kind of really brief snapshot of a much larger group of material. I think I skipped one. I thought I, oh, I didn't do classics. Classics, I just wanted to mention um, that there were, it was, there were a lot. He was really interested in classic literature. There were editions of, of um, kind of commentary editions, translations, multiple languages, um, 10 copies of Virgil, that kind of thing. Um, the religious texts were really fascinating. It was a mixture of Bibles and various editions, concordances, sermons, histories, natural, uh, natural religion. So um, some examples are John Tillotson's popular sermons, which argued for religious inspiration through natural means versus divine revelation. John Mill's groundbreaking edition of the Greek New Testament, which identified 30,000 variant readings, launching a series of counter offenses offensives by conservatives like Daniel Whitby, who was also included in the library. We see John Pearson's influential work on the Apostles' Creed and, of course, a copy of The Whole Duty of Man. And philosophy is, um, this is my last category. This was really interesting, I think, um, especially because of the early date of the collection. So we get the heavy hitters like Bale and Hobbes, Descartes and Locke. Um, Eliot had three editions of the essay on human understanding alone. Um, we get Lord Shaftesbury, Francis Hutcheson, Mandeville, Pascal, Madame de Lambert, um, one work by Spinoza. And I think also interesting is what's not here because in 1738, we're still kind of early. So um, we're a year before Hume's uh, treatise on human nature has appeared, decades before Adam Smith and Rousseau. And um, Voltaire, who was born in the same year uh, as Lord Minto, is you know still at the beginning stages of his career. So um, to kind of summarize, I think this type of holistic mixture of legal texts with works of history, philosophy, classics, religion, et cetera, um, is found in the libraries of other Scottish legal professionals from the first half of the 18th century. Because um, as a, a number of scholars have shown who are working on Scottish lawyers' libraries, um, that these collections often went beyond the need for professional consultation to include materials suitable for sociability and cultivating the life of the mind in the wider sense because of the importance of um, Scottish lawyers and the kind of intellectual and civic life of Edinburgh, as we've seen. Um, I, I was just reading a, a book about Edinburgh, Edinburgh by James Buchan, and he referred to Lord Keynes as a lawyer, philosopher, agriculturist, agriculturist. And I think this is exactly um, the way that we could describe his close friend and contemporary, Lord Minto, as well. Um, so another question, I'm just going to show you this, uh, this catalog again, because we're getting back now to um, the library. I want to talk about its location. Next. Um, so this catalog brings up an interesting question about location because um, it does name Edinburgh as it's as this the place where it was at the time. And I'm guessing this this refers to that townhouse built around 1726. But it's a really interesting year because it is the same year that William Adams started working on the country estate. So um, this suggests to me that the catalog might have been made with an upcoming move in mind. Um, <clears throat> sadly, it doesn't proclaim its purpose. I wish it did. I wish more catalogs did. Um, but we do get some clues to the circumstances of its making by some loose documents that came with it. So one of these documents shown on the left was a 48 page manuscript in loose sheets um, in a contemporary hand entitled A Catalog of Books Belonging to My Lord Minto. And it lists about the same number of titles with the same um, the same balance of bibliographical details. But here, rather than being arranged alphabetically, they're arranged miscellaneously. And they, uh, they have these kind of check marks. It, it looks like a, a really quick and dirty inventory was kind of being taken. And it's accompanied by this alphabetical chart on the right, in which the titles were moved over from the miscellaneous list into these alphabetical headings. And then 
within those alphabetical headings, they were numbered one through whatever in terms of, you know, how they fell in alphabetical order within those headings. And then you can see how this chart with these titles um, enumerated this way could be used to make a very neat handwritten, well-ordered manuscript library catalog like the one we see. So I'm a librarian and I love this because it showed a kind of behind the scenes inner workings of an early modern library management project. So um, whether or not the 1738 catalog was made with an impending move in mind, uh, the majority of the books would eventually be moved to the new house. We don't have too much information about the library room specifically, other than it was on an upper floor on the east side, most likely above a suite of bedrooms on the principal floor. Situating a library on the upper floor, known as the Skyed Library, was a popular architectural feature in country Scottish country houses from this period. So um, most typically there's Arniston House's High Library. Other examples are at um, we're at Haddo House and um, the House of Dunn and Ingus. And then, of course, there's this beautifully preserved example um, at Traquair House, which was not designed by William Adam. Many thanks to Brian Hilliard for that point, but does, I think, give us an idea of what this 18th century elevated library sp space might have looked like. And um, it, has, it has been suggested that placing the library in this space away from the main arteries of the house would have been done to provide a place of quiet and solitude or a place for intimate social gatherings, while also making sure the books were kind of raised above um, the damp lower levels. So the library remained on the upper level in Mento House, let's go back to that, until um, a later renovation in about 1814, which brought it down to the principal level. And that was also a typical kind of arc of the early 19th century, seeing a move from an upper floor to a lower floor. So um, I don't know how physically large the library was, although I do know that it was smaller than its 19th century replacement, which was about 45 by 25 feet. I'm also not sure exactly when it was finished. So in 1743, um, I can from the archival records, I can tell that only the first story of the new Minto house was complete. The grounds were still covered in rubble. The windows had just been ordered. And in 1746, Lord Minto was still receiving bids for plaster work from um, one, including one from Thomas Clayton who had done work on New Hills Library. So I can't imagine it was too much longer after that, that, um, that they moved in. Um, I, we do have a shelf list from another Minto catalog that was made sometime after 1804 but before the 1814 library move. So it, it evidently does refer to the 18th century space. And that's reinforced by this note that I circled in red um, that the shelf list that follows is not to be copied, which um, I think means the shelf list should not be copied into a new catalog that was being made to accompany the new space that, that happened in about the 1820s. So I think it's pretty safe to say that this shelf list does represent the shelves in the 18th century room. It includes 14 cases uh, identified alphabetically from A to Q and the letters F, H, and J are skipped. I don't know why. Each case has between three and 11 shelves for a total of about 30 shelves altogether. There are roughly um, 2,850 volumes listed here, which shows modest growth from the 2,200 listed in the 1738 catalog. But this later catalog includes 4,000 titles. So I think this probably shows us that the 18th century space was just too small by this point. Um, quickly, just an aside on, on ownership uh, markings, because those can be really helpful in determining chronology. I haven't had very much luck other than the book in um, Bill's access collection that I showed you. Um, a lot of Minto books have this book plate, but um, some of the shelf marks correspond to that earlier shelf list and some don't. So I think that they were probably applied after the move in about 1804, 14. But um, these, are, these are very prominent. I think what we can say is that Elliot seemed to actively use and enjoy his library. So we get a really nice anecdote from the family's 19th century biographer who tells us 
that it was in the country that Lord Minto's real enjoyment lay. And these are the, um, the rolling hills around Minto in the background there. We're surrounded with his family, or sorry, um, and as soon as the courts rose and the business of circuit was over, he hurried off to Minto. We're surrounded with his family and his books and occupied with his farm and his improvements. He passed the happiest days of his life. And we can also um, guess that the library was used to foster literary education and appreciation among his children. Jam, uh, James Ramsey tells us in Scotland and Scotsman in the 18th century that the second baronet had been at pains to give his son, the third baronet, an excellent education, ensuring that he not only wrote but also spoke English, and there's an emphasis on spoke, both in public and in private, with as much grace and propriety as if he had been bred at court, end quote. The third baronet would go on to pen some light verses of his own and become renowned for his critical judgment in literary matters. So David Hume, John Home, and William Robertson would all submit manuscripts of their influential works for his review before publishing them. But what is less known is that the second baronet's daughter, Jean, or Jane, as she was called by the family, was also um, endowed with literary talent and given a good education. So I'm just gonna dwell on her for a few minutes here because she's very little known. Born in 1727, at least I, I haven't been able to find too much. Born in 1727 and living until 1805, she is best known for writing around 1756, the lyrics to an old folk ballad about the Battle of Flodden Field. According to an often repeated and possibly um, not accurate family ac anecdote, but it's widely told, Jane was riding with her brother, the third baronet, in a coach through South Selkirkshire when he wagered a pair of gloves or a set of ribbons that his 28-year-old sister could not write a song about Flodden. She accepted the challenge, and the result was the Flowers of the Forest, a set of verses in Scots commemorating the many Scottish soldiers who died in the Battle of Flodden Fields. Sir Walter Scott, it became very popular, these lyrics. Um, Sir Walter Scott, who was a close friend of the Elliot family, reproduced them in his 1803 Border Minstrelsy. Although Jane at the time um, with that Scott published this in 1803 was 75 years old and asked not to be identified as the author. Jane Elliot never married. She lived with her father until his death in April of 1766. A 19th century family historian reported that she shared her father's intellectual tastes and accomplishments in a larger degree than her, bro her brothers and characterized her thus, quote, endowed with qualities of mind and character such as attract confidence in youth and reverence in age, she had no small influence in the family circle, an influence increased by a natural gift of persuasive eloquence varied on due occasion with the terse, incisive speech that gave to the silver tongue a point of steel. Like her father, she was a great reader and to a considerable knowledge of the classic authors of England and France, she added an intimate familiarity with the poetical legends of the borders." End quote. Elsewhere, she is described as having a remarkably clear head and it's even told that she, as a, as a young girl, read her father's law papers and evidently assisted him with his legal work throughout his life. And she also loved French literature. When her father died in 1766, Jane moved into a townhouse in Brown Square in Edinburgh, um, erected just a few years previously in the area where Chambers Street meets George uh, IV Bridge now. And from these premises, she was a frequent, although um, apparently very reserved and diffident, participant in the cultural and intellectual life of the city until 1805. We get a glimpse of her at the end of her life when she is memorably described as the last living woman in Edinburgh who kept a private sedan chair in her lobby upon which she was born around the city by the last living caddies. So um, one of my like favorite findings was this book, which um, although I haven't been able to find anything actually in her voice in the archives, I did find a copy of a book with her ownership inscription at Cambridge University Library, um, a copy of the letters of Madame de Maintenon published in Paris in 1753. So that was really nice because she was um, said to, have, to particularly have loved French literature. Um, so getting back, we're kind of running to the end here, um, getting back to the second Baronet's Library, 
Unfortunately, I don't have too much documentation after the 1738 catalog. The next catalog that survives is that 1804, 1814 um, catalog that I talked about earlier with the, with the older shelf list. And that one was produced under, their, under the second baronet's grandson, Sir Gilbert Elliot, fourth baronet and later first Earl of Minto. What is clear is that the Minto House Library, once established, became the site of a rapidly expanding family library used and loved by many succeeding generations until the first half of the 20th century. At its peak in the mid 19th century, it had about 12,000 volumes and was described by a traveler as, quote, one of the most valuable private collections in the south of Scotland, end quote. When a thorough inventory of the books in Minto House was taken in 1938, it still had close to 12,000 volumes. The house itself was requisitioned during World War II and abandoned by the family either at that time or not too long before. In 1952, it was leased and then purchased by a girls' boarding school. But the year before that, on 22 to 24 January 1951, 1951 there was a sale um, at Sotheby's of about 2,000 volumes from Minto House. And since the family no longer has any of the books, I am guessing that most of the other nine or 10,000 or so volumes went into the trade at this time. Um, the books are all over the place now. Um, with Minto book plates constantly showing up on library shelves and on the market. And part of my larger project involves tracing copies of these books and trying to work out the chronology of the book plates. So I'm ending on this side because if you have any in your libraries or private collections, please email me. These are the five I've been able to identify so far. Um, so in conclusion, I would like to present Sir Gilbert Elliot, second baronet as a worthy addition to the community of legal literati in early 18th century enlightenment Edinburgh. Although there is nothing particularly surprising or unusual about the library, it fits in well with what we know about other related collections of the time and contributes more information about the fascinating and I think less often explored early 18th century period sandwiched between the Union and the Jacobite, uh, Jacobite uprising of 45. Moreover, as the first installment of a 200 year span of catalog making by the Elliott family, it helps us to understand how a Scottish aristocratic family library um, was begun and evolved over time. And more personally for me, it appeals as a private library catalog accompanied by evidence of its own making, which allows us to get a tiny step closer to the library in its domestic setting, which can be so hard to recover otherwise. So that is that is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Megan. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, and I can see that there's some applause in the chat here. Um, and I'm just having a look. I can see there's already a question. So we'll go straight to that. And it's from Elizabeth Lawrence who asks, do any of the Mintos turn up as borrowers in the books and borrowing database? And she's referring, of course, to that project, books and borrowing project, which is compiling um, catalogues of libraries. Yeah, I haven't checked yet. Um, I was really sorry to miss the conference, um, but that's something I have not looked at yet, but is on the list of things to do. Oh, I can see another message from Kit Baston, who is involved in the project. And as, as you said, um, wrote her thesis on um, Ereskine's library saying she'll have a look. So that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question and that is from what you showed of the titles in the um, on the different subject slides, it looked like this library really illustrates that moment in um, serious reading history where language the the language of scholarship and the language of research switches from latin to english um and, and other vernaculars that um, a lot of the earlier stuff is in latin and certainly the more contemporary publication is all in english would you say that's fair yeah i think that's definitely fair um I, one of the nice things about this project is that 
I've because I've um, this is how this is how I have fun. I like made a spreadsheet of <laughs> of the library, um, which was how I was able to get the number of volumes and do this categorical breakdown. That's kind of recent, so I haven't played with the data um, too much yet. But there's definitely a way that I could sort things in a way to see how the the language development is potting out with the chronology and um but but overall impression from just looking through it is yes I think that's about right and do you think that that would make it more accessible maybe to um Jean Minto for instance Jean Elliott I don't know that's such an interesting question I mean she was um you know she was clearly literate if she was helping him with his legal paperwork I'm guessing she knew Latin as well um and I just other than that that one book in her own library, there's just nothing. I can't find anything about this. This period in particular is kind of the early 18th century. There wasn't a whole lot in the archive. So um, I'm wondering, you know, if I can get at her in, in another way. But I do think that, you know, there was there's a really nice variety. There were works of, there were Belle Lettre, I didn't really get into that, but in addition to the works of arts and sciences, there were works of literature and um, satires and political history. So I think I think it would have been a really great reading library to have in your house and to be able to go down and and enjoy yourself. Yeah, I can see there's another question from Peter Freshwater. How did Minto acquire his books? I don't have a whole lot of information. Um, I was able to find every pretty much everything that I showed you in this slideshow was what I was able to find in the archives, which is not too much. There's that list from the auction of 1736. So he was clearly going to auctions. Um, there's trying to think of, I'm sure some things were probably acquired as gifts. You know, we have that book from Bill's collection, which seems like it was probably acquired as a gift. Um, I'm guessing he was buying books, but I don't have the records. I think, you know, it's probably, um, probably a mixture of things. I don't think, and I, this is, again, this is more impressionistic because there, there isn't a lot of documentation. I don't think that his father was acquiring a lot of the least variety. I can see, um, some of the works of, some of the legal texts and some of the religious literature seem kind of to match his personality based on what we know of it. Um, but I think the a lot of the arts and sciences and the philosophy and the belles lettres, I think probably was acquired by the second baronet, even if I don't have the, you know, the, the bills of sale. Uh, the auction list, was that in his hand or somebody else's? Oh, that's a quick, it could be. I'll have to look at it again. I do have a, I do have his handwriting. Um, yeah. I have some best specimens so I could take a look. I do know that the initials um, here on the, the plate on the left are definitely his because they match yeah. his letters. It's something I think it's it's quite hard to tell. And, and as you say, the evidence doesn't always survive, but you know, do you, you do you, does does somebody of that level in society buy their own books and go into bookshops or do you, does an agent do it for them or maybe the person who compiled the catalog some, you just don't know yeah that's a good question if anybody here has a, a better understanding of that kind of on the mm. ground process that would be really interesting to know more about I can see there's another question in the chat from oh, Georgiana Ziegler saying um, just noting a number of mental books in the Folger Libraries catalog have you looked there yet no, that's so that's next. Um, I've been working on this. This is part of a larger project in the library. Um, so there's a lot of material. And I finally, through this talk and the, the talk I gave in London a few months ago, I feel like I'm finally at a point where now I can start really looking at copies mm -hmm. of books and see what they tell me. So while I was in London in February, I went to a few libraries there. And I'm starting to kind of put together lists of things um of books in, in libraries so I will definitely check out the Folger that's good to know right. um I wanted to ask you you mentioned to acquire and um also Andrew Fletcher of Saltoon and of, particularly in the Lothians at this point there's a lot of um 
there's a there are a lot of collectors and a lot of libraries being developed are, is there any evidence of sir gilbert elliott having contact with any of those people or um, any exchanges or visiting any of these libraries or any influence of this network of people building up really good libraries you know it's it's so it's like so close i can you can kind of sense it from people he was friends with in this correspondence you know the fact that he was um commissioning William Adam to do his townhouse and his country house um, 40, 30 miles away from some of these other libraries with, with other people who were in the legal profession. I mean, they must've known each other. He must've been part of this network. And I think, you know, talking about, again, kind of next stage of the research would be to now start looking at some of those other collections of correspondence and see if I can see things from him or just kind of get the the hard evidence for those for those contacts um but he must have i mean he must have been in communication and, and part he was he was clearly part of this legal literati bibliophile worlds i know um with new house library for instance my colleague robert betters did some work on that and as you said this is the you know the beget the early enlightenment or pre-enlightenment period and the assumption about the new house library was it was mostly built up by the third earl who was active during the high enlightenment but robert found that quite a lot of it was actually assembled earlier and i think perhaps this contributes to that mapping of actually a lot of the building of the libraries and a lot of the interest and again the kind of seeds of the enlightenment come from this really active assembly of books in the earlier part of the century and even back into the um, 17th century yeah i mean that was you know that was one of the reasons i really wanted to dive into the second baronet in particular because he really has been overlooked because the third baronet is really part of that second half of the 18th century he's very active member of parliament. He's kind of known for this, um, you know, mm -hmm. being in that in that world. But it really seemed to me like the second baronet was so fundamental in establishing the library in the first place, building the library space like you know the Dalrymple case, and um, and then conveying these these values and these educational standards to his children. Um, and I just wanted to I wanted to bring that out a bit because it's. It was, it's very, it's been very silent in the research on the Elliots that I saw. Yeah. And as you say, this country house, actually, this is the generation that's building a lot of the libraries and moving away from um, cupboards of book, a cupboard in the study or a press in the study or a few shelves in a room, which is a study to a room, which is actually the library. I can see a couple more comments in the chat from Kit Baston. Um, there are borrower records for the second and third Mintos in the Advocates Library borrower records, but there's no entries for them yet. So watch this space. That will be really interesting. And I would be really interested to know if when you find books from their, from the Minto Library, if there's any evidence that they previously belonged to the Advocates Library, because of course they were able to borrow the books. Um, yeah. So it was it was even in those decades, it was a legal deposit library. And I do sometimes wonder when there are things you think we should surely have that in the National Library collections from 18th century, advo 18th century advocates collections. You do wonder if actually an advocate um, took advantage of their borrowing privileges to make off with the book. That would be interesting. And he did serve on the committee for the Faculty of Advocates Library. I'm not mm. I haven't gotten those dates nailed down yet, but it would, probably would have been in the 1420s. Um, I mean, 1720s, sorry. So um, yeah, there's definitely some possibility there. That'd be interesting. Um, there's a question from Elizabeth Lawrence. Given the date the library was dispersed, it seems very probable that quite a lot ended up in institutional collections in North America. I wonder whether purchasing records of any of the libraries might give a clue as to which bookseller sold the part of the collection which didn't go to auction. Yeah, I'm starting to build that picture up a little bit. So far, I haven't been able to find um, any bookseller that seems really prominent. It's my my impression, but again, I'm very early in this part of the project, but my impression is that they're just so widely scattered. They are just all over the place, all kinds of, um, say mainly dealers in in the UK and some in the States. But, um, you know, and they're, they're coming on the market all the time. There's no way I can keep up with them all, but 
I, I'm putting my email here in, in case you find any to send them to me because I do have a spreadsheet and I'm, I'm trying to see what patterns will emerge. Um, but my sense is of just really wide distribution. Do you have any um, idea of doing a digital reunification project where you're able to bring back together online these books that have been dispersed physically? You know, that would be fun. Um, I, I'm currently doing my PhD degree, so I don't have the resources of a major institution, but um, I would be very interested in participating, you know, like the Books and Borrowers Project, maybe. I don't, I don't know if this really fits or, you know, if I, I, I guess another reason I'm happy to be giving this talk is because you all are aware of projects that this might fit into. And I do have, you know, some data in my spreadsheet that might be able to contribute to, to a project or I don't know. It's I would I would be very interested in seeing if I could contribute. Great. I have one final question. And if anyone else would like to ask a final question as well, please do put it in the chat. And mine is um, the catalogue. Is it all books or is there, are there pamphlets or newspapers or other kinds of materials in it? It's all books. Um, there are a few manuscripts, but they're mainly um, kind of sessions, papers, manuscripts and professional things. So not manuscripts acquired, you know, as manuscripts. Um, no, I don't really see much pamphlet literature. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean it wasn't there, but I don't see it in the catalogue. That's interesting. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so I think we're going to draw this to a close. And before I um, wrap up, I just want to mention that this was, I think, our last um, speaker event of the year. But um, we also have our next event is an actual in-person visit, which after a few years of lockdown and so on has, is really exciting. So on the 2nd of June, um, EBS will be visiting the Edward Clark Collection at Edinburgh Napier University on their Murchison campus. Um, if you would like to attend, please contact our secretary, Heather Holmes, by Sunday, 25th of June. There's a limited number of attendees, so places will be allocated on first come basis. So please do get in touch with Heather. Um, her email is secretary at, um, let's see, secretary at edbibsoc.org um, if you would like to join that visit and it'd be great if you can come. So I'll just finish by saying finally, thank you so much, Megan. It's been so interesting to hear about this and I'm sure people will be keeping an eagle eye out for any um, Minto book plates or evidence of an Elliot of Minto ownership of books in their collections or other things they come across. And um, all best wishes for the PhD and the rest of your research. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Thank coming today. Bye-bye. So